If you have young adults in your family, it would be a shame if they didn't know the writing of Joan Bauer. She is an award-winning writer, especially for young adults. Our guest today is Joan Bauer. Please stay with us. Welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and New York Times bestselling author, screenwriter, and speaker Joan Bauer joins me now. Joan has won numerous awards for her 14 novels for young readers, including the Newbery Honor Medal and three Christopher Awards. Her most recent book is called Raising Lumi, about guide dog training and puppy raising. Joan has twice participated in the U.S. State Department's Professional Speakers Bureau, traveling to both Croatia and Kazakhstan. She's currently working on a musical adaptation of her first novel called Squash, and she's the screenwriter for the film adaptation of her award-winning novel, Hope Was Here. Joan, a longtime Brooklyn resident, now lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico with her husband, Evan. She's here with us today to talk about her career, why she writes for young adults, and the faith and the values that matter the most to her. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome back an old friend to Personally Speaking, Joan Bauer. For our, for our <laughs> viewers and listeners, we are on with Joan Bauer. Years ago, I used to be the director of an organization called the Christopher's, great organization, better to light one candle than to curse the darkness. And we would time and time again, give awards to Joan Bauer. So I got to know Joan Bauer and read her stuff, a great writer. And I just decided after all these years, I got to talk to Joan Bauer again. So thank you so much for coming on Personally Speaking, Joan. I am thrilled. I am thrilled. You're 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 one of the great one of the great interviewers and uh, I, a I man with great heart. So I'm very <laughs> excited to spend now, some time with you this morning. Well, well, I want to spend time with you, and I want to ask you this. Uh, you know, back then it was really at the cusp of uh, the world of gadgets and everyone having their own cell phone and everything else and living on the screen. When you're a writer and you're used to people buying books and reading yeah. books. What has this monumental change in our culture meant for you in terms of writing and reaching the young adults with whom you have a special bond? Yeah, well, I, that's a fabulous question. And certainly social media and all of this has changed yeah. things. The good parts are that uh, we have ebooks now. We right. have access to stories. We have, you know, easy, easy ways in and out to really get books in different forms. The challenge, the challenge is, is that reading scores are just as low as they've ever been. Yeah. And trying to encourage kids to get away from the screen and actually to take a book, to use your imagination is, is harder, but not impossible. So, yeah. You know, Joan, it, I realized uh, my mom passed away three weeks ago. And one of the things that I'm sorry. Uh, she was a great lady, 102, and I took care of her the last 20 years of her life. I'm grateful for every moment. But both she and my dad, from the moment we were raised, books in our hands, books in our hands. And and I can't go anywhere. If I'm waiting for a doctor's appointment, I'm in the waiting office. I got to have a book with me. You don't want to waste time. What are kids filling themselves with, if not the books? Is it all social media or is it just a lot of downtime with no particular brain stimulus. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lot of his social media. The the, mm. the number of times that teenagers text during during a day is yeah. is absolutely extraordinary. And sometimes, you know, I'm always interested when I when I hear about two teenagers texting each other in the same room. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's wrong this with this not, picture? Yeah, right. This is not right. <laughs> but just 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 jumping back to what you said about always having a book and always I got to tell you something. This is one of the things that we adults can do. Yeah. We can show, we can be carrying those books. We can be reading them. We can do this in our families. You know, we can read together. It's hard. It feels like an impenetrable wall sometimes, yeah. but there's something different about just a good story. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 it slides through doors. It just does. It, yeah. it goes into places that other things don't. So showing adults you know, walking around with books, teachers who have a bunch of books on their desks, you know, I mean, parents reading and, you know, encouraging us all to do that. 
But yeah, I mean, there's no way that what's happened hasn't affected people. But, 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 you know, at the core of it, at the core of it, a good story is a good story. Yeah. And And how do we get kids to, you know, want to sit down and embrace it? Because you don't take your phone necessarily and embrace it, but you can cuddle up with a book. You just can do that. And to find those ways and those opportunities are so important. I think it's one of the most important things right now that we have to understand, because just imagine to grow up without being a good reader. Yeah. Just imagine yeah. to grow up really without any kind of sense of books. I can't I imagine. had I had a marvelous letter from a young man um, who had gotten back from Afghanistan a few years ago. He was 22 years old. The last book that he had read, he was 15 years old. And it was one of my stories. Wow. Good and for, good for him and, and for I, you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know. He, <laughs> he wrote me a letter and I wrote him back. And he said, I just remember these things. It was about a girl whose father was an alcoholic. And his dad had trouble with drinking too. I just remember those things and those layers. And, you know, that's a connection. And, oh, I would do, if I could do anything, I would would try to reach out. And I am trying to reach out and do more of that. But, you know, books leave that kind of imprint on. The, the wonderful author Joan Bowers, I guess, you know, you not only write about these things, talk about these things, but but you and Evan also had the experience of being parents. What worked when you were raising Jean? Like, was she naturally given to being a reader of books or did you have to plant good seed? Yeah, yeah. No, she was natural. I mean, I read to her in the womb. You know? <laughs> I really did. I had this she never had a chance. narrative yeah. with, with my baby, you know. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it, from the absolute beginning, we did yeah. do that. And she's, you know, she's smart as a whip. And thank you for remembering for remembering that. And she got her PhD, you know, so she's <laughs> You know, she's she's all of that, but she talks about she talks about that. And even in when, when we were on car trips, we would read to each other in the car. Wow. Even when she was in high school, we would read to each other. It was so much fun. And we would pass a book around. So it was this sort of not just, you know, stories for you. There, there were, in, you know, we were sharing those as a family and laughing together as a family. So that is, uh, you know, that's a absolutely marvelous that's a marvelous memory. And, it, and it's hard right now because, you know, there's also, liter- uh, you know, literacy problems with adults. Yes, One in five adults in our country, yeah. has, you know, is, is, it has some challenges with reading. So, you know, how do we embrace this whole thing together? And I think it's just, I think it's just going back and just sharing stories together. And if you're not a good reader, well, you know what? There are z- zillions of audiobooks yeah. to sit down, you know, and listen and get the story and get the rhythm. You know, I had the privilege of meeting and getting to know Barbara Bush. And when she made literacy oh. her issue, I was like, well, how big an issue is it? And she'd say, it is a big issue. And then not too long ago, you know, when I get to do people's weddings, I ask yeah. them each to write me an essay. Why of all the people in the world, why is this the one? And in one case recently, she wrote a decent essay and he never got his homework into me. The wedding is coming up. And when I got to the church, I was like furious with him. I said, what is your problem? I said, you know, all I did was ask you to write a page or two on this woman you say you love. What's the problem? And he he fills up with tears and he says, well, I I never learned to read and write. And and I I was, first of all, I was heartbroken. I was stupid enough to pick on him. And then I just embraced the guy and I said, let's sit down. You talk to me and I'll write and we'll figure yeah. th- this thing out. But the fact that there are people suffering who don't know how, to, as you said, that literacy is a problem, that that reading skills are so low at this point. What did the pandemic bring to all this? It, did it help oh. or hurt? Oh, it did. No. Well, you know what? It's interesting. I mean, I suppose in some ways, you know, people were reading more during the pandemic who were readers. But when you look at what happened with the schools and so many kids, you know, learning on Zoom, I, 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 I tell you, I think, you know, it's just amazing what people kept on doing despite, despite that pain. But yeah, it did, we, you know, it folded us up and it caused, it it just caused a lack of kind of sharing. And I think there was a lot, even more social media as a result of it, because people were alone and, you know, some of that is good, but some of it just, it, it, it's such a lie. 
And it makes you feel so inferior to other people. How many likes did I get? What did I do? You know, yeah. and, and a lot oh, yeah. of the information is so manipulative. You're yes. not dealing, you're not dealing with truth. No. So yeah, that that was a challenge. I would love to just be able to sit down with a bunch of people and say, look, I think in some ways, everybody, everybody got broken up during the pandemic, not just you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We're all a little backward now socially. You know, yeah. we 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 spent too much time with each other yeah. to, alone. And and how to please know this? It's not just you. It's not just you. And I think that's not a bad thing to say to the kids who are challenged with reading. It's not no. just you. There are so many, but there are people who really know how to help you. And there are stories that will get in your heart that will make you want to read and read and read again. Joan Bauer, award-winning writer is our guest. You know, I, both before and during the pandemic, occasionally I go to theater and some of the theaters did this thing, Joan, which was amazing. They they didn't want people, you know, uh, disturbing the Broadway play. So you had to put your cell phone in a lock bag and you could not uh, get your cell phone till the end of the play. And yeah. during intermission, I had people say, I feel like totally vulnerable totally naked. I feel like a huge part of me is missing. We have become dependent on these machines. Yeah. I found That's it right. liberating, you know, I, for at least two hours, I, I didn't have to worry about who's calling me or getting back to anyone. Um, would you ever recommend that we give ourselves a trial of putting the phone away for a while? Oh, I really would. I really would. <laughs> um, and I I have done it myself. And I know several, you know, other people who have done it. I think that's a great, you know, they have they have uh, what do they call it? They have no no shopping months, you know, to try to get your finances in shape. Well, probably a month is too long for a cell phone, but I would. We have to put it down. It can't be. It's not an organ in our bodies. Right, and yet we right. carry it around as though it is and say, well, I'm going to look at it. I'm going to check my mail. You know, I'm going to check my mail, you know, three times during the day. I'm going to text my friends during this hour, but then I'm going to put it down. It's, I think we have to do that. I think parents have to do it. Kids have to do it. Um, there's there's more joy with without it, I think. I think so, too. We feel liberated. You know, because I was caretaker for my mom, I could never not have it at my side. But sure. I have to tell you, it's mom, I, I say this with all due respect, for the three weeks that I haven't had her with me humanly, I, uh, I feel a liberation in that. I don't have to have myself with me all the time because be the mom or her caretaker is not going to call me. Let, let's go back to something that I wanted to ask you about your gifts and talents. You, uh, you, you're a great communicator. You know that you have this gift, which I want to talk to you about how you develop that gift. But first, um, when you have that gift and you choose a particular kind of climate or group of people you want to write about, you could have written about any group anywhere. You chose young adults to reach them in a way that you're gifted at doing. Why young adults? That's a great question. You know, in some ways, I think it kind of chose me. I uh -huh. had been doing some screenwriting and I had a very bad car accident many, many, many years ago. I had just signed a big deal with a big talent agency and like three days later, I was in a car accident. And I remember really thinking that I wasn't going to be able to write again because I was in a lot of pain. I couldn't sit at my desk. I had to have neurosurgery. I mean, it was a, I mean, it was a dark night of my soul. And in the midst of recovery, mm -hmm. I started getting this idea to write a story about a teenager. Well, I'd never written about a teenager. And not just a teenager, a teenager who, listened to this, wanted to grow the biggest pumpkin in Iowa. She had this crazy <laughs> idea. And I thought it's got to be the painkillers, you know, what is this, where is this coming from? Right. But right. I actually almost heard her voice she knew what she wanted. She was tough. She was gritty. She was funny. I was none of those things at that time. And I didn't want to pay attention to it, but it was such a strong kind of a sense of this idea. I began writing it. And I found as I did that, I found that I was pulling from myself as a kid. Because, you know, I grew up like you with just books all over the place. I mean, my grandmother was a professional storyteller. And yet I was not a particular, particularly popular kid. I, I had a lot of woundedness and I carried that around with me. But I found then that writing for young people, I use that every day because I know 
I know it's hard. It's really hard. I'm not the only one who knows. I don't mean that at all. But every story that I write has got some of my real woundedness as a kid, some of the hope that I have as an adult. And so that's kind of the genesis of how it came. Joan, Joan Bauer, in another interview, this was striking to me because it was a side of you I, I guess I didn't understand. You said, adversity, if we let it, will make us stronger. And now you talked about the car accident a moment ago and other challenges in life growing up. Uh, now, I guess you'd expect me to do this because I'm a, a priest, but um, when when you have really tough times and adversity, um, I believe that it's okay to shake your fist in the hand of God, in the face of God and say, you know, I know you didn't bring these adversities to me, but you're God. You can make life a lot easier. In, yeah. in your in your progression as a as a as a as a person growing and evolving through adversity, did you go through many stages of anger, not just at God, but at the people around you who didn't make it easier for you? Oh, sure I did. I really did. And I thought I didn't feel comfortable. I wish I'd talked to you, you know. <laughs> I wish I had known you back then. Because I just felt guilty. I thought, oh, I'm a terrible person. I'm this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, I did. I I was angry at God. And I really didn't think he loved me. Mm. I didn't. And, you know, all around me, you know, God loves you, all these little stuff. And I thought, I don't think so. This doesn't yeah. feel like love to me. Yeah. And yet then, you know, you begin to understand our definition of love versus God's profound, all-consuming, ever-present, you know, being with us Absolutely. in love and in care. And then that was a progression that I had to uh, that I had to find. And it happened when my dad died. Oh. And he died very tragically. I was beside myself. He died suddenly and tragic. It was a mess. And I remember the weekend of his funeral. And I was just, I could hardly breathe. I was so upset. And I felt every once in a while, a hand on my shoulder and I'd look around and there was nothing there. And I thought, well, somebody put their hand on my, and they went, what happened too many times? And it was always a hand of comfort. Never, oh. never hard, never harsh. And I realized at the end of that, and I was not, you know, I, I was probably an agnostic back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I realized that that was God telling me you know what? Not only do I, I really love you, and I really want to help you get through this. I will never, never, never forget that. And it's now informed, you know, dark times for me. You know, uh, when you're a preacher, as I am, uh, I'll talk about what my perception of God is. And I'll say there's nothing you have ever done, nothing you will ever do that can separate you from the love of God, which is from mm -hmm. St. Paul and that you can run as long and as hard and as fast as you want away from God. And the moment you're out of breath and you can't go another step, you turn around, there's God with arms open wide. And wow. I get sometimes, because the mass is online, I get these people saying, your view of God is a little too progressive, a little too liberal. You know, where's the where's the tough God? And I say, yeah. I'm just going to the resource. You know, this is the God I believe in. This is the God I learned about. And, and, and you're right what you said. I, I wish we all knew back then that, that we have a God of love who, even when we can't take that next step, carries us in the times we can't be carried you know i mean the times i can't take that next step he's going to get me through um even now you know i i love her so much i'm constantly you know saying mom you help me out but god you help me too and and i believe god does that i gotta ask you this too part of yeah. what carries you through life every time when i do these weddings i told you i ask people to write me an essay on why is this the one like there's a billion people out there you could marry why is this the one how did you come to decide years ago i can make a life with this guy evan Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he was just, we, he was just wonderful. And first of all, he had this voice, you know, he had the voice. <laughs> so, you know, when you think about staying with somebody for the rest of your life, you know what it's that little voice like? <laughs> he had a voice, man. It was like fabulous. But he was just, he had a richness of spirit. He yeah. just had a richness and he had, he was so intelligent, but he never was in your face about it. He, he, he always tried to, he had that marvelous sense that of, of really understanding that in marriage, we are there to help each other and to really lift each other up, not, not to compete with each other, you know, not to always have to win every argument. Right. And what he did, I would not be a writer today if it were not for Evan. I mean, wow. he, he's an IT genius and he's had some 
big jobs in the computer mm-hmm. business. But when it was time for me to get a computer, and we didn't have a whole lot of money back then, he got me the best one. Uh-huh. He had the one that wasn't as good. He taught me about that, you know. Um, you know, he just he has just put things together for me. He so supports me. I just, I mean, you know, he's amazing. He's really amazing. And he cooks. <laughs> <laughs> and Let's, he cooks. Yeah, you know, is God good enough? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he does. You know, when I when I meet with the young couples who are planning to get married at the end, one of my questions always is, which one of you cooks? And if one of them does, I feel good. But if neither, neither of them do, I say, oh, man, this That's marriage. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they better learn quick because, you know, we do need to eat in this thing. But we I, do. I, I got to ask you, because you're, you're a through your writing, you're a, uh, a person who brings people together. You're a reconciler. I mentioned that to you because um, uh, we, we had uh, just before you, we had Luke Russert, uh, Tim Russert's son on, who's written the one oh, yeah. about losing his dad. But we talked about uh, the, the the world we live in, the country we live in. And, yeah. and I, I think it's probably true that we're as divided as we've ever been. Do you I have agree. any insight? Because you've been bringing the message of reconciliation in many forms mm-hmm. through your writing to young people. Do you have any hope for our country and for our world that we can ever pull together and and recognize the the commonness of our humanity? Well, first of all, thank you for saying that, that about me. That, that means the world. But it's true. And I do have... It's hard. Yeah. You know, I think we are in almost a famine of hope yeah. in some places in our land. People can't quite see it or yeah. reach enough. They kind of hope that it might there might be some hope, yeah. but they don't really see it pressing out. And I think that in our in our world, things are masquerading as other things. Yeah. Rage is masquerading as wisdom and strength. And, you know, we're seeing things back and forth and, and kids are just broken. But there, I have this handwritten sign in my office and I don't remember who said it. This just knocks me out. It said, the good has not lost its power to illuminate our lives. Yes. I tell you, I hold on to that every morning And I think that Mm -hmm. people on every side of the spectrum right now, that there is something that we all share other than oxygen. And that is, we all want to be heard. You know, we want to be loved. We want to have a voice. There are things we care about. You know, we don't want to live alone in our world. And I think this is why, you know, getting back to, it sounds like an advertising, no. but getting yeah. back to stories that might be able to reach out to a lot of different kinds of folks is a very powerful gift yeah. that a, a powerful tool that we have right now. I promise this will be the wrap up question, but it's important. No. <laughs> when I'm at the back door of church, it almost happens every week that somebody will say, look, I don't know why you preach that homily, but it was exactly what I needed to hear at this moment yeah. in my life. And and I have to be honest with them. And I'll say, I don't know where the heck I got that homily from. I said, I'll, I'll give credit to the, the one up above for giving me something to say. And apparently it touched you. But Joan, when, when I've read your books, when people read your books, they feel you're speaking directly to them and their experience. And, and I've often wondered when I've read your stuff, like, where does she get the inspiration? Is it too highfalutin to say that a lot of it is from the talent that God gave Joan Bauer, but a lot of it is truly inspired. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, it's, I do feel, my grandmother was a professional storyteller. I really feel called. It's not a job. Mm-hmm. I feel called. And as you know, you you are certainly called. And that puts a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different twist on it. And I know that it's not about me. Mm-hmm. It's my name on the it's my name on the book. But one of the things I've learned over the years is that in some ways, what I do is I'm just kind of building a coat rack for people, and I put stuff in a story, stuff that has hurt me. Um, you know, choices that I I think show how people can walk out within a fictional context. I kind of bring in new mentors, stuff like that. But it's a coat rack. Man, I just want you to put your stuff on it. Put your stuff on it. Is there something that 
links you to this story. That's my joy. I mean, I I think that my hope, my hope is that when I write a story and I work very, very hard to create characters that are relatable, mm -hmm. that go through enough stuff that, you know, it's more universal. I look for that um, because those are the kinds of stories that I needed, you know, and but I, I, yeah, I, I just, I try to put myself and put my pain and come back into it and realize this is how I climbed out. Mm -hmm. And I, I pray, oh my gosh, I really do. I pray for these stories. I ask God to stop anything that's not right. God I is ask listening. To bring new things in, you know, yeah. I just, I just do, but I, 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 I genuinely love it. And I can't, people say, well, if you couldn't do this, what would you do? And I go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you're called to do. You know, uh, I want to yeah. thank Joan Bauer for being with us. And she used the uh, expression of being called to do this. Voco vocari, to be called is a vocation and it's a gift from oh. God. And, and you've got that. And I will admit, I shouldn't confess this because I'm an adult of some years, but uh, I have read, you know, so much of what you write. And maybe I'm yeah. just locked into my young adult years because- your books always speak to me, and uh, and I I just I'm you're such a gift, Joan. You really are. Your writing is a gift. You personally are a gift. Your willingness in an interview like this to be as you always are, open, honest, forthcoming about the good, the bad, the challenging we all face. Um, I hope I hope you never stop writing, and I hope generations okay. to come can say, no, Joan Joan Bowers with God, but I still take out her books and I still learn every time about oh. the joy of being human and and that struggle and adversity. Can in fact make us stronger and better people. Thank mm. you for being Joan Thank Bauer. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this meant so much. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you for the extraordinary work that you do. It's so Thanks important. Thanks so much, Joan. As we end today's program, if you'd like to reach out to me for any reason, you can get me at personally speaking podcast at gmail.com. Aside from listening to us on Sirius XM, the Catholic channel, you can also watch us on YouTube by going to Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti. Please hit like and subscribe. We're also, as you probably know, on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Losanti. And now we're also on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, Personally Speaking. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.